Okay, so the English Civil War was a massive event in world history, uh, though many people don't realise the significance of it. And uh, it meant that Britain became really the first merchant class run entire country, rather than just a small city state or whatever. And uh, one of the first things that they did was accelerate enclosure and private, privatisation of land. Um, the next thing was 1694 was the incorporation of something called the Private Bank of England. It was a royal charter granted for 12 years and it was the birth of fractional reserve banking in Britain. Now fractional reserve banking means that the banks can actually lend out far more money than they actually have in, in deposits so they can manufacture money out of thin air quite legally with fractional reserve and uh, lend it out at interest. Now if you can do that it's impossible for you not to make a profit. Uh, now, the idea of a fractional reserve is that you can only lend out a part uh, extra of money that you don't have. Now, many of these banks now, uh, nowadays, the investment banks, are leveraged something like 50 times. So they have actually made up 50 times more money every year than they actually have in deposits, and they're lending this out at interest. So the banks are getting very, very greedy and fraudulent. So as soon as you introduce this kind of system into banking, which the Bank of England did uh, back in 1694, what you're doing is you're em embedding fraud into your money system. So not only have the merchants gained control of the land through privatisation, allowing them to privatise land, take it off the people for their own use, they've also now started to monopolise and control the money system. So the money that everybody needs in order to work to live, to buy food, where they used to grow their own, is now also under control. So these are kind of uh, a, a kind of two-pronged conspiracy against the people by the rich ruling elite. The idea is to keep this quiet, to keep it secret throughout history, so that they can continue this bind of taking more and more control of people's lives uh, and taking away our freedoms. So that was 1694, incorporation of the Bank of England. Uh, of course, it was supposed to be only existing for 12 years to help the king over a few problems, but uh, it's carried on right to this day. Going on a few years to 1759, uh, there was a massive expose of something called the Hellfire Club. Now, this was uh, Medmenham Abbey near High Wycombe, and these guys were supposedly monks, but actually they were devil worshippers. They had satanic orgies, uh, and most in interestingly, Francis Dashwood who was uh, in charge of this uh, club, they called the Monks of Medmenham, um, was the Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time. And coincidentally, I mean, that was between 1762 and 1763, he was bringing in all sorts of cuts at the time, uh, and very, very unpopular, not entirely unlike our Chancellor George Osborne today. So uh, the idea that there are sort of uh, sex orgies going on and something called the Hellfire Club which starts to look like a, some kind of satanic organisation right at the very top of uh, British society uh, was exposed 100% back in 1759. Now this is a long, long time ago but of course lessons have been learned and there's no reason to suggest that such clubs don't exist today uh, where powerful people are entrapped through uh, their sexual peccadilloes into these kinds of organisations and then really their loyalty to the people is broken completely. Uh, so check out the Hellfire Club, 1759, uh, Medmenham Abbey near High Wycombe and in fact if you want you can even go and visit uh, the caves where these orgies took place and these secret meetings uh, where the Chancellor of the Exchequer was plotting against the British people uh, in High Wycombe. Uh, 1776 uh, was the date of the formation of something called the Illuminati now, this was a German organisation originally. Uh, Adam Weishaupt was a professor of church law at Ingolstadt University in Germany. People think the Illuminati is just a conspiracy, but certainly there's lots and lots of information from the 1700s uh, about how this organisation set about taking over European Freemasonry. So Freemasonry at the time was a sort of speakeasy club, uh, and yet there were big conventions where the Illuminati said, well, look, actually, we want to be the governing body of Freemasonry right across the world. And also they were involved in all sorts of other things. Um, now, John Robeson wrote a very good book called Proofs of a Conspiracy Against All the Religions and Governments of Europe. And I would suggest that this is one of the best sources for any information about any kind of equivalent of a modern-day Illuminati. 
uh, was Robeson's leaks because what he did is he actually got hold of original material written by these original conspirators, including the initiation rites that they did uh, in German, and he was a fluent German and French speaker and translated them into English. So uh, he did a fantastic job, Robeson. He also was uh, the secretary of the Royal Society in Edinburgh, a very well-respected Freemason. Uh, didn't like the way that the Illuminati were attacking Freemasonry. He was also a close personal friend of the inventor of the steam engine, James Watt. He was a very well-respected member of society, an extremely good source on these kind of conspiracies. And so the title of his book again, which is available on the internet through sacredtexts.com, uh, is Proofs of a Conspiracy Against All the Religions and Governments of Europe. And that's what the Illuminati were planning, was to take over any religion, all religions, uh, infiltrate quietly, and the same with governments, so through political parties and also through the civil services of various countries. It's all in there, if you uh, care to have a look, and the techniques that they were going to use, secret uh, liaisons behind the scenes to infiltrate. Uh, there's another book called The Code of the Illuminés, I-L-U-M-I-N-E-S, by Abbe Baruel. That's A-double-B-E-B-A-double-R-U-E-L, and that was published in 1798. Now, this might seem a long time ago, but these are really interesting source materials on organisations, cons conspiratorial-type organisations, that can completely control government from behind the scenes. A, a kind of secret government a parallel government that the press are not aware of and that the people are not aware of and that many honest politicians and churchmen are not aware of. OK, so going on to uh, 1789, and this is something that which the Illuminati were very much implicated in, was the French Revolution. Uh, they were seen to be operating through the Grand Orient Masonic Lodges in France to foment hatred of the, the French king. Um, it was also seen as by some, as the revenge of the Templars, because, of course, it had been the French royal family which had ordered the arrest of the Templars uh, hundreds of years before. Uh, so, I'm going to read you a little quote now about the French Revolution from uh, this book, which is Dennis Wheatley's Library of the Occult, actually by Dennis Wheatley. This is an extract from an essay called The Devil's Secret Societies. What he says is, the Knights Templar were an order of chivalry founded for the rescue of the Holy Sepulchre. Their main base was Malta. In their decadence, perverted by evil successors to the early Grand Masters, initiates had to spit three times on the cross and swear allegiance to the devil in the form of a bearded idol named Baphomet. Their headquarters in Paris was a palace fortress called the Temple. King Philip IV had their Grand Master Jacques de Molay and many of his knights arrested there and brought to trial for heresy. They were burnt at the stake, but the order swore to be avenged upon the monarchy of France. Five hundred years later it was, from the tower of the temple, Louis XVI was taken to the guillotine, and the temple had been chosen for his prison. That was not a chance. The French Revolution was directed by the Masonic Lodge of the Grand Orient, which had inherited the championship of evil. Now that's uh, from Dennis Wheatley. Uh, Dennis Wheatley, as a source, is actually very, very good. People like Montague Summers, Roland Ahmed, uh, and Alistair Crowley himself, uh, who were involved in black magic and occultism during the Second World War and around about that time, the 1930s. Wheatley actually personally interviewed these people. So uh, I think he's actually quite a credible source and a credible witness to these uh, events. By 1815, after the French Revolution, the enclosure of England was pretty much complete. That is to say, almost every single piece of land field in Britain uh, had actually been privatised and sold off. So that, but, you know, England really didn't have a peasantry anymore after that. Just to note that there is one village in Nottinghamshire which has still not been enclosed. That's owned by the Crown Estate, interestingly enough, uh, and that's called Laxton in Nottinghamshire. If you go to Laxton, you'll find that the local people do ha actually have access to the local fields, you can walk around there, there's no restrictions on, uh, you haven't got to stick to footpaths or anything like that, and you can see what a pre-enclosure village, village was like. That's the last one left, that's in Laxton in, in Nottinghamshire, uh, near to Newark, if you're ever up that way. Uh, 1847 to 1851, the Irish potato famine, where we all know about the tens of thousands of people that died in the terrible conditions in Ireland, and of course this was the kind of situation that this enclosure privatisation of land led to incredibly impoverished peasants 
just simply try, who don't even own their own land, trying to eke out a living. Uh, in 1879, the Irish Land League was started by a guy called Michael David. Now, the Land League, what they did was they, or they were organised to, basically, to boycott and take back land to fight for the right to stay on land, to not be evicted, and all this kind of thing. So it was one of the precursors to the Irish um, independence. And the Land League were very, very successful. Eventually, uh, they lobbied their MPs, and the Irish used to, in those days, send MPs to Westminster, and they held the balance of power, rather like uh, uh, the Liberal Party does now in 2011. And through that power, they, what they did is they managed to get lots of land back to the people, uh, arranged government loans to pay off the absentee landlords, the English lords mostly, uh, Protestant English lords, and uh, build a, ha a house on the peasants, on the, the, the poor farmers' old, own land. So overnight, overnight, what happened in Ireland was that the old farmers, the small farmers, owned their own land and built a brand new home on that property. And the repayments on those government loans were much less than the old rents they'd been paying to the old landlords. And they created really a model there for land reform in Ireland, which we should follow here in Britain. Um, to give people security of tenure is absolutely basic. So they did that in Ireland. Uh, in 1888, um, the Highland clearances were horrific in Scotland. People were being burnt alive in their own homes as they were evicted cleared out of the properties, and this of course was one of the final waves of enclosure, land privatisation going on in Britain. Um, it was uh, all stopped at the Battle of the Braes in the Isle of Skye. There was a very good organisation amongst the women of Skye, and when some people came to evict some police from Glasgow, the women organised to attack the eviction party, and the, uh, the, then there was massive news coverage of it in the Times in London, the grievances of the crofters, and there was a, a, a royal commission to look into the grievances of the crofters and the crofting acts, the crofting laws in Scotland were then put into force. Crofting is very different to the way we do things here in England uh, because it means that you can't actually sell or buy your property and it can't be used as security against a loan because the property, the croft, can only pass through your family. And if, say, for example, you don't have any descendants, what happens is the local crofters all get together and they decide who should be awarded that croft. It's not interchangeable for money. The land, crucially, is not interchangeable for money. This is the traditional system. So if you're ever up in Scotland, go and have a look at the crofting museums, go and talk to the crofters. They will explain to you how things should be done and how things used to be done here in Britain. And that was the natural way. They understood the very basic human right, which we seem to have forgotten about today, which is security of tenure. You have the right to stay, and you have the right to some land which you can call your own. Uh, so that was 1888, the Highland Clearances, and the Battle of the Braes in Skye, which changed things around for the Scots. And of course, there's a burgeoning land reform movement now in Scotland, which recognises the importance of this. So uh, we, had, uh, we have something now... Uh, which many people would call a kind of new world order, which is an occultic kind of way of running things. We've got the Prime Minister at the moment, who's a member of the Bullingdon Club. We have George Osborne, who's the Chancellor. He's also a member of the Bullingdon Club. We have Michael Gove, who's the Education Secretary in charge of all our children's education. Uh, and I don't think he'll be talking about this curriculum. He's also a member of the Bullingdon Club. Boris Johnson, the Mayor of London, a member of the Bullingdon Club. And Mark Thatcher, also Thatcher's son, member of the Bullingdon Club. So we've got a tiny elite running the country in Britain and I think you'll probably agree that this is one of the most occultic governments we've ever had. And I'd just like to finish with something about the New World Order written by Dennis Wheatley back in uh, the Second World War. I actually wrote this during the Second World War. He says, The New World Order which they wish to bring about is but another name for hell. If through them evil prevailed, every man and woman of every race and colour would finally be enslaved from the cradle to the grave they would be brought up to worship might instead of right and would be taught to condone or even praise murder, torture and the suppression of all liberty as necessary to the welfare of the state. And look at some of the executions that have been going on in Iraq recently uh, where we criticised Saddam beforehand for having executions. Incontestable proof of, the, uh, of that has already been given us by the way in which the young Nazi-educated Germans have behaved in Poland, Czechoslovakia, Norway, Holland, Belgium and France. They butchered old men, women and children who did not even seek to oppose them. 
That was part of the plan, and they obeyed the order to commit these murders in cold blood, without a single recorded instance of any protest against them by officers or men. Seven years of the totalitarian poison has been enough for the evil to grip five million German youths, and with it their hearts have gone cold and stony. If they triumph within 70 years, such words as justice, toleration, freedom and compassion would have ceased to have a place in the vocabularies of the races of mankind. All family life will be at an end, except for the conquerors, and the only, the worst elements spiritually will be allowed to procreate fresh generations to populate a world divided into masters and slaves. The right to homes and children of their own would be reserved to the overlords. The rest would be herded into barracks and reduced to the level of robots without the right to read or speak or even think for themselves. There could be no revolt because every officer, priest, deputy, editor, magistrate, writer and any other leader of free thought and action in the conquered countries would already have been executed by the firing squads and leaderless herds cannot prevail against tanks, tear gas, bombs and machine guns. So that was what uh, um, Dennis Wheatley was writing uh, in 1941 about the new world order and of course the Nazis used the word world order and this is a world, word which is being trotted out quite a lot today. So I think we just have to be aware of how we've got, where we are, where we may be going, and also the fact that there's not necessarily an end to the Nazi style of system just because they took off their uniforms. The Allies even tried to cover up the death of Martin Bormann, who was Hitler's successor after the Second World War. And many people were smuggled out who were war criminals uh, to safe havens in South America and in the United States, and even in Wimbledon here in Britain. So uh, I think we just have to be aware that the, the whole Nazi thing may not have gone forever, it may have just gone underground. You're watching the South Blessed Community Channel with me, Tony Gosling, on Alternative History.